How many of you all know that he had to rescue your life from yourself? Lord, have mercy. If I would have been left in control of my own life, I have set myself up for failure, to die, and to go to hell. But I'm so glad that he had enough love for me to rescue me from me. I wish I had somebody in here that understands there's nobody to blame but you. I know you want to blame your mom. I, I know you want to blame your daddy. I, I know you want to blame your enemies. And, and you even may want to blame Satan, but there is nobody to blame. But you for you. Because you had a choice of whom you would serve. And I'm glad that he came and rescued my life. And because he did, I can decree and declare that I'm never going back. I don't care how much money you throw at me, I'm never going back. I don't care how much fame and fortune you throw at me, I'm never going back. I have made up my mind. I'm like the old folks, I'm going to run on to see what the end is going to be. I believe there's something better waiting on me on the other side. See, y'all don't understand. I'm not worried about the streets paved with gold. I'm not worried about having a mansion in heaven. I'm not worried about jewels being on my crown. All I want to do is be able to see Jesus. Because I owe him a thank you for saving me. For loving me when I didn't think no one else loved me. How many of you all know he loved you when you were unlovable? Somebody ought to give him a hallelujah on this morning. He didn't, he didn't wait until you cleaned yourself up to love you. Oh, y'all. He loved you while you were a fornicator. He loved you while you were drinking alcohol. He loved you while you were addicted to crack and cocaine. He loved you even when you didn't love yourself. Hallelujah. Y'all sit down before I get off track and start testifying. But see, I don't have to go back too many years to remember what the Lord has done for me. I'm like that old song when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me. My soul cries out. Hallelujah. 
because you've seen a wretch like me. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and move on and, and try my best to, to preach this message on this morning. And as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm so glad that death could not hold him down. But for those of you who have been with me a while in ministry, you know that God does not normally have me preaching seasonal messages because I believe I'm speaking to some people on this morning that know he got up. I believe I'm speaking to somebody that already knows that he is risen and that he is alive. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I don't think I need to tell you that it was on the third day that that great big stone was rolled away. And they went looking for him but could not find him. Because he told them that if you tear down this temple in three days, I will build it up again. And I'm glad that he is our living Savior. He is the resurrection and the life. But on this morning, God has a word for us, and it will be found in the book of Luke, chapter 14. I will read normally more than I normally read. We're going to read verses 15 through 24. I'm going to read the total parable into your hearing on this morning. Luke, chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. When someone has it, say amen. If you don't mind, please read, stand to your feet as we read from the word of the Lord. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Of God. Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidding, Come, for all things are ready now, are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excuse. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Jesus is telling a parable, and there's a great man who 
made a supper and he sent out a many invitations and when it was time the Bible says in verse 17 and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden come for all things are now ready Then they started making excuses one by one as to why they could not come. And then the man, being angry, said, okay, go out into the lanes of the street. And go get the, the blind and the healer and the, and the halt and bring them in. And the servant said, I've done what you asked me to do, but there's still yet room. He said, well, then go out into the highways and the hedges and can tell them to come so that my house may be filled because those who made an excuse will not taste of my supper. So as I was with the Lord on yesterday, he drew my attention as only he can to the 17th verse, I believe, of of Luke chapter 4 and the Bible says and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden come for all things are now ready I want to preach with the help of the Holy Spirit from this subject matter everything is ready Father, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you, we just give you all the glory and the honor, and we magnify you on this morning, this season, this time that we have set aside to recognize and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to say thank you from the very fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of praise we want to offer unto you because you are worthy of our praise. Thank you for what you have done so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, God, speak to us from the very throne of heaven. Thank you that the table has been set and everything is now ready. We give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let somebody in the house say amen. 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 Can you help me one time before you sit down and tell somebody everything is ready? There is a man that is sitting or sitting at meat for dinner with Jesus while he has just taught on humility. If you take time to go back and read the first portion of Luke chapter 14, what you will find is that Jesus is having a discussion with his disciples and he begins to talk to them about humility. He instructs them that if they were ever invited to a wedding to take the lowest seat and not the highest seat so that if someone who is of more esteem than them would come into the wedding, you would not have to be embarrassed when the person who is in charge of the wedding tells you to get up and move and let somebody who is greater than you have your seat. So he says, when you come into the wedding, just take the lowest place in the house and then allow somebody to ask you to move up. He is prophetically laying down some powerful revelation and foundation. And then he also goes on to say, if you're going to prepare a dinner, he says, if you're going to prepare a dinner, prepare the dinner for those who are not your friends. Because if you prepare a dinner for your friends, your friends will they'll come back and invite you back to dinner, and then you already have your reward or your recompense. He says, but if you're going to prepare a great dinner, prepare for those who are less fortunate, the poor those who are in need. And he says, and when you, they are finished, 
He says, it will be heaven who will give you your reward. Upon hearing this, there's a man that is sitting at dinner with Jesus, and he says unto Jesus, it blesses, blessed are those that shall eat in the kingdom of God. This word, as I have said so many times, this word blessed in the text does not mean to be happy, because to be happy means that you have to have favorable circumstances. However, this word blessed actually means to be fully satisfied because when you have Christ in you, you do not need favorable circumstances to have favor. In fact, even in things that aren't favorable, you are still blessed. Why? Because you have Christ living on the inside. Therefore, I am not dependent on things being good in my life in order for me to have good. Because I've got good living on the inside. And how many of you understand that when, when you get to heaven, heaven will not be a place of favorable circumstances. Heaven will be a place of favor. Huh. There will not be unfavorable circumstances there, so there will not have to be favorable circumstances there because you will be living in favor, because you will be living in the presence of God. Therefore, you will always be fully satisfied, lacking nothing. There will be no want in heaven. So he says, blessed is that man that will eat in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus turns around. And says another parable, that there was a man who made a great supper. <laughs> now when you take this, and you have to stay with me to catch the totality of the revelation, but as you look at the, that Jesus is now given another parable to the man who is sitting at meat, who has just heard the parable about humility, and how blessed it is to be at meat or sitting or eating in the kingdom of God. He turns around and he says, well, there was this great man who had made this great supper. So a man had made a great feast or a banquet. And this should be considered in your mind not some ordinary dinner. You will do the text a great disservice if you think of this as some dinner you made in your house that you invited a few friends over to share with you. That is not this. This is a banquet. This is a feast. In fact, when you read and interpret the text, it actually suggests that it is sumptuous. It is extremely costly, highly luxurious, and totally magnificent. If you could imagine, it would be the type of banquet that we would throw for the President of the United States. That is not the type of dinner you have at your house. See, dinner at your house may consist of some fried chicken, some macaroni and cheese, and some collard greens. And you think you have put on a spread. But you don't know a spread until you've seen a spread. I'm talking about a banquet. I'm talking about a feast that has everything that you could possibly imagine to indulge yourself in, the very finest of quality. Oh, God. Dishes that you can't even imagine because you've never tasted them before. There will be no macaroni and cheese unless it has some additional things in it like lobster. It won't be ordinary. There's nothing there ordinary. Most of the food that would be there you could not even pronounce. But if it hits your palate, it will blow your mind. Y'all, 
See, some of you all don't have any idea of what I'm talking about because the greatest place you've ever eaten is Ruby Tuesday. But sometimes we need to expand our horizon and go and see places of what the rich indulge in on a normal basis. This is a sumptuous feast. It is, it is magnificent. It is extremely costly. It is of the highest quality. It, is, it has everything that you could possibly imagine. And what's also is very important as I deal with the text is that anytime you throw a feast or a banquet of this magnitude, there's always going to be a guest of honor. Somebody is going to be the main person that's going to be there. That would again would be like the president when he shows up. It would be in his, his honor. And this great man who threw this great feast had invited many to the feast. Invitations went out for people to come and participate in the feast. Watch this, and you have to hold on to this. And they accepted the invitation. I'm going to try to give you an analogy of what is taking place here because I think the greatest analogy that you could understand is that of a wedding. Where the bride and groom have now put together a great reception. But they are the guests of honor. But they are also the one who's paying for it. Oh, y'all. See, it's one thing to be invited to a banquet or a feast and you have to pay for your meal. But normally, I'm saying normally, because now there are some exceptions. When you go to a wedding, you normally don't have to pay for your meal. Because the bride and the groom has already paid for everything that you are about to indulge in. Are y'all with me? And then they send out invitations to have people to participate in their day. It's not your day, it's their day. You are invited to participate in their day, but they have spent all the money. And it is based upon who has accepted the invitation. And it is extremely rude and forbidding to show up at the reception without an invitation. In fact, you should not show up unless you've been invited and you have done an RSVP to say that you are coming. So this man, this great man, I'm going somewhere. This great man has thrown this feast. He has, he has prepared this great feast. And he had sent out the invitations, and the invitations have been accepted. But what is so unusual about this feast is that the invited guests had to wait until the feast was ready. There was not a time for them to show up. They had no set time to come. You have n never, I don't think, been invited to a banquet or a feast when people had not told you what time to be there. However, this man has created this great feast. He has sent out invitations, but he does not tell his guests when to show up. So now they are waiting with great anticipation for when they can come. They don't know exactly what time they are, that they're going to be allowed to show up. But how many of you understand because of what it is that they're about to go to, they have to have great anticipation to arrive. They just don't know when 
it will be time. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, there are some things that we have been waiting on with great anticipation to happen so that we can participate in it, but we did not know the exact time that it would come to pass. invitation has gone out. You have accepted the invitation and you are now anticipating, participating into something that you know is about to happen. The only problem is you don't know when it's going to happen. But that hasn't stopped your anticipation. How many of you all understand that God has great things in store for you? You just don't know when they're going to happen. And if you knew when they were going to happen, then you would know when to show up. But you don't know when to show up. You just have to wait until you are called to know when to come. So the guest of honor sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now I could have easily skipped over one of the main points in the text, but I chose deliberately by the spirit of the living God to share with you that the text tells us that it is supper time. I have been trying to, for years now, teach you how to glean from the word of God. Somebody at some point is actually going to listen to me. Because I have begged you that when God gives you details in the text, do not skip over them. Because they are important. And the fact that he tells us it is supper time is extremely important. Because this feast of this magnitude and this quality could have been done at any time of the day. But it was specifically a dinner or supper time feast because normally you will not put on something of this magnitude for lunch. If I'm going to serve you lunch, I'm going to serve you lunch. Lunch is not a main course. Lunch is just enough to hold you over until the main dinner comes. But at dinner time, I can give you everything. Y'all are not with me this morning. For what I'm trying to get you to understand, that if the text tells us that it is supper time, then prophetically it has given us a clue of the time that we are living in. And the last time I checked, supper time is usually when it's getting late in the evening. So what is the Spirit of the Lord saying to us that it is getting late? In the evening, y'all that grew up in the old church, you used to hear this all the time. It's getting late in the evening and the sun is going down. That was the old people's way of telling you that Jesus was on his way back. Now, if you begin to hear now what the Spirit of the Lord is actually saying to the church, he is letting the church know that we are living in the last days. Oh, y'all, it is getting late in the evening and the sun is going down because we are getting close to Jesus' return. So that's why it is appropriate for this meal to be given now because it has to be supper time. This is not lunch time. This is supper time. In fact, what God has sent me to tell you, there are some things that happened in your life, but it happened in your life because it was lunch. In other words, he gave you a taste, something just to hold you over until the main course. Because what he had for you was too great for you to have during lunch. It could only be given to you at supper time. Oh, you don't hear me. I don't throw a spread like I throw a spread when it's dinner time. The same spread is not the kind of spread I throw for lunch. For lunch, you may get some hamburgers and some hot dogs. But for dinner, 
I have to go all out because there's a difference between lunch and dinner. Y'all are not with me because when I eat lunch, I can get me some chicken tenders or I can get me some fries or I can go grab a burger from somewhere. But when it's time for dinner, give me something with some substance that's going to hold me over all throughout the night until I get up the next morning. I want something that was worth me waiting 12 hours to get. Supper time is the right time to throw a feast. And the body of Christ needs to understand that it is getting late in the evening. And the sun is going down and it is supper time. And now because it is supper time, he turns to his servant and he says to his servant, now send word and tell my invited guests to come. Why? For all things are now ready. He doesn't tell people to come until everything How many of you are like me? I don't like showing up for dinner and then having to wait an hour. Maybe that's just me. Don't invite me to your house at 6 o'clock for dinner and then serve it at 7.30. Because I'm going to be an hour and a half of frustration. Are you okay? Y'all, I, I know I'm the only one, but I came hungry. And if it ain't ready, don't tell me to come. Because if you're going to tell me to come, I expect you to be ready. Yeah. Y'all ain't with me. I know, I know y'all. Because see, some of y'all are, are, are the bad guests or the bad host. You're the one who say be there at six and then serve dinner at seven. You, yeah, that's you. But if I tell you to come to my house at six o'clock, Dinner will be ready at 6 o'clock. You come at 6.15, things are getting cold. In fact, if I tell you to show up at 6, you may want to get there at a quarter till, knowing that at 6 o'clock, everything is going to hit the table. So you have to understand what the, what the guest of honor is doing here. He is telling the people, I'm not going to tell you to come until everything Oh, y'all, I could run around this church until everything is ready because I do not want you to have to wait for what I have for you. You've already waited long enough to get the invitation. Then you waited to get me to tell you to come. Now, when I tell you to come, I'm going to give you that which you've been waiting for. Tell somebody your wait is over. If you ever get the word to come, that means your wait is over. That means everything you've been waiting on is now ready. Oh, y'all, tell somebody everything is ready. It's ready now. See, see, I, you whatever you've been waiting for God to give you, he sent me prophetically to tell you to come. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, come, 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 come. This is the word you've been waiting on. This is the time you've been waiting on. This is the word from heaven that you've been waiting on. You've been waiting for somebody to tell you to come. And why is it time for you to come? Because everything, not some of it, oh, y'all, not the macaroni and cheese and the rice, but not the steak. I said everything is, oh, y'all. See, it's one thing, or what are we waiting on? We're waiting for this to get done, or we're waiting on this to get done, but that is already ready. That means you ain't a good cook. Because if you're a good cook, you know how to coordinate everything getting ready at the right time. I'm glad that I serve a God who knows how to pull everything together and make it happen right when he wants it to happen. He is not derelict to his duty. If he says, come, everything has to be. He says, come, 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 because everything is now ready. Everything is now Ready, listen to me. Everything that you've been anticipating, participating in, 
is ready. Uh, Y'all give me about 10 minutes. Somebody tell your neighbor your blessings are ready. Tell, somebody tell somebody your healing is ready. Your deliverance is ready. Your peace is ready. Your prosperity is ready. Your promises are ready. In fact, what I've come to tell you, everything is Y'all catch me real quick. See, when, when you were singing the song earlier, release, you said release your glory. You said release your power. You said release your healing. And God sent me to tell you everything has been released. He's not going to give it to you piecemeal. He's going to give you everything because everything is ready right now, you, y'all, if you ever catch what God just said, somebody would get excited down in your spirit. You would be so excited right now because everything is now ready. You don't have to wait any longer for your deliverance. You don't have to wait any longer for your healing. You don't have to wait any longer for your peace. You don't have to wait any longer for your prosperity. You don't have to wait any longer for your breakthrough. You don't have to wait any longer for your salvation. You don't have to wait any longer for your healing. Everything that you need, it is ready. And it's all, everything is ready right. He says everything is ready right. Right now, but watch this, watch this, watch this, watch the text because... Although everything is ready, the Bible says, and they all with one consent begin to make excuses. Are you serious? Now that everything is ready, now you're going to start making excuses as to why you can't come? And you want to know what makes the text so sad, Brother Quentin? The people who were making excuses were the people who had previously accepted the invitation. Because, see, if you had not accepted the invitation, you would not have to make an excuse to be excused. The only reason you have to ask to be excused is if you were expected to come. And the expectation to come wasn't because you were forced to. You were invited to. And you accepted the invitation. And now that everything is ready... You start making excuses. You literally begin to beg and to plead to be excused from participating. Watch this in something that costs you nothing. They had other things that they deemed more important than to come and give honor through their attendance and participation to the guest of honor. Your attendance at the dinner brings honor to the guest of honor. Have you ever thrown something and people came? And you literally say to them, 
You don't have to bring a gift. Your presence is enough. Y'all, y'all there. <laughs> Why is your presence enough? Because your presence tells me that you thought enough of me to come. I meant enough to you that you set aside time in your busy schedule to come and help celebrate me. I've come to tell you that God wants your participation because it brings him honor. You're not even required to bring a gift. He just wants you to come. And by coming, you say to him, I love you. I honor you through my attendance. But these people who had been invited started making excuses for why they did not want to come. In fact, listen, to decline participation after accepting the invitation was considered offensive because the guest of honor prepared for your participation. Food was prepared. Money was spent. Tables were set. All expecting a certain number of people to come and they spent money knowing or thinking you were coming because you said you were coming and to not show up is offensive. Because if you would have told me that you did not want to come, I would not have prepared for you to be there. But if I am a guest of honor and I look out at empty seats, y'all, every empty seat is offensive. Because it means that somebody lacked the common courtesy to show up for what I paid for you to participate in. And if you didn't want to come, all you had to do was deny the invitation. So the servant, he came and he showed the Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. The Lord is now angry. You didn't hear what I just said. God is angry. This goes against most of your theology that you don't believe that God ever gets angry. <laughs> but then you don't know the God you serve. Because God can get angry, but his anger is not like man's anger. Because his anger is always righteous. And now he is angry because of those who want it to be excused, but the banquet is ready. So therefore, instead of letting it all go to waste, which was his option. Y'all, God, come on, Holy Ghost. I'm the, it's only me and you this morning. Do you understand that the Lord could just let it all go to waste? You don't understand that. Because you have not caught this concept that God is rich enough all sufficient enough that preparing something for people who don't want to show up 
will not dent his bank account. See, see, it will cost you a lot to have to get back what you spent. It won't cost God anything. Because he is abundant. So he has the choice of just letting it all go to waste. Or he can send out new invitations. So he makes the decision to have the servant go out into the streets in the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the disabled, the lame, and the blind. Why? Since those who were originally invited do not want to participate and turn me down. And it does not bother them, watch this, because they think of themselves of doing me a favor by coming. Have you ever invited somebody to something and they think they're doing you a favor if they come? Watch this. The people who have turned the master down have prioritized themselves over him. In fact, they think they are doing God a favor by showing up. In fact, they think they're doing God a favor by allowing him to bless them. Or y'all. In fact, they think they are just as honorable as the guest of honor. And the problem that we're having in the body of Christ is that we have too many people in the body of Christ think that they're doing God a favor by God blessing them. Like it should be them that's being honored and not him. Because they are are equal. There are many people in the body of Christ who want to be the guest of honor instead of the invited guest. And now that the Lord is angry, he says to the servant, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and get all the people in the city who are lame and hithered and halt and blind. And I want you to invite them to come. Because God is about to move on from those in the kingdom who have a mindset that they are doing God a favor to have him bless them. So God is sending the Holy Spirit to extend an invitation to those who have been, who have not been originally invited. Can I share something with you? When God created this great feast. You were not invited. Are y'all with me? Okay, let me let me say this one more time because I'm I'm a, I'm doing a quick spirit spirit check. When God created this great feast, you were not originally invited. There were other people to be invited, but they chose to make excuses. So God sent the Holy Ghost back out. To find people who were sick, weak, ineffective, for y'all, not useful, for y'all. He sent an invitation out to people who were not originally invited, but who won't be offended by getting invited now. 
See, this is why I wanted to do a spirit check. Because I, when I said what I said, I wanted to see if you were offended by the statement that I made that you were not originally invited to be a participant in the feast. Because if a fence rose up on the inside of you, you ain't invited now either. Oh God, y'all, y'all not going to like me. Oh, this is supposed to be Resurrection Sunday. I'm supposed to be telling you he got up on the third morning, on the third day. With all power in his hand, and you were supposed to be jumping and shouting. Here I am telling you that if you got offended, you're about to miss out. Because God wanted to see who in here and who is listening. That if he told you that you were not originally invited, that you still would not be offended. You would still be just glad that you're about to get an invitation. Watch this. Tell somebody, I am not offended. I'm grateful. So y'all ain't grateful. I'm going to say it one more. I'm going to try this side. Tell your neighbor on this side, I am not offended. I'm grateful. Now, see, you could sit there and be offended that you were not included in the first invitation or the original invitation. I'm not offended. I'm just grateful that he is going to give me an opportunity to be a part of something that wasn't, uh, wasn't my original purpose or destiny. But since somebody else didn't want it, oh God, since they didn't want what you had for them, I don't mind you having it for now for me. You think I'm going to be offended, God? Somebody tell the devil, you got the wrong person. I am not offended. I'm grateful. If you don't want what God has for you, I'll take it. Somebody tell the God, I'll take it. I'll accept the invitation. If they don't want to come, ask me to come. I'll come. If I'm the last person you choose, I'll. I heard about it. And now you're going to ask me, tell me I can be about it. Watch this. He said, listen to me. God sent me to tell you he's inviting the poor. He's inviting the disabled. He's inviting the lame. He's inviting the blind. In other words, those of us who are flawed and have issues, who have eyes but can't see, who have legs but can't walk, we have problems. We have been left with weaknesses, we're ineffective, and we may not be useful, but what you don't understand about me, all of my issues have taught me how to be humble. See, he's rejecting the proud, but he's going after the humble. And here's how he knows you're humble because you've been taught how to be humble through your afflictions. God Almighty, I wish I had somebody in here that God taught you how to be humble by allowing you to go through some things, by allowing you to be afflicted. By allowing you to have to suffer. By allowing you to have flaws and issues. Because what flaws and issues will do for you, it will keep you before the face of the Almighty God. It will make you understand that it ain't about you. That it has to be about Him. And do, am I talking to anybody who knows that you've got some flaws, some imperfections, and some issues, but every time you think about with everything that is wrong with you, that God chose you anyway, it makes you humble because you know you weren't worthy because you are messed up from the floor up. But He chose you. See, I can tell folks who understand that the glory is of God and not of you. Because you are humble that he chose you 
even the way you are right now. Because if God could choose anybody, why would he choose somebody like me? You could have had your choice of anybody, God. Why would you choose somebody like me? I'm the center of all sinners. No. No. I came to God broken, hurting, flawed, issues. And even with all of that, he still chose me. That's why, people of God, I'm too humble to be offended. I'm just so grateful that if he's going to choose anybody, he's going to choose me. So he said, he says, go out and get all of them. Go get the the lame and the blind and the halt and, and bring them in. And then, watch this, verse 22, and the servant says, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. How many people turned him down? Because now they've done gone out and got all the those who have issues. Everybody like me. And he says to the master of the house or the guest of honor, he says, and there's still yet room. So the, the guest of honor says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into the hedges. And I want you to go into the highways and I want you to compel them to come, so that my house may be filled. In other words, God says, I don't want to waste one place. Y'all, God has sent out a word that if you don't want it, I'll keep going until I find someone who does. So now that you brought in all the flaws and the issues and, and the broken and, and those who have been humbled because of the things that they have gone through, who refused to be offended even though they weren't originally a part of the invitation, he said, now go out, go out, go out. In verse 29, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come that they that my house may be filled. He says, now what I want you to do is go out and get all the unexpected guests. Go out and get the people that no one else would ever think that they would be invited. You know the people that you turn around and say, I would have never imagined that you would be here. He says, go get them. Now watch this, and I'm about to I'm about to close. When you look at the text and you break the text down, it's actually telling us that what the master of the house is saying is, is go outside of the city, the citizens of the city, and go get the Gentiles. Go get the people who are not included as part of my kingdom. See, here's the thing about you. You had issues, but you still were a citizen. You were still a part of the kingdom. He says, now I want those who are not a part of the kingdom. I want the Gentiles. I, I want the excluded. So you know what God told me to tell you was about to happen? He's going after the sinners. He's literally saying, if my people reject what I have for them, I'll go get people. Yes. 
I'll go pull the sinners into the kingdom. And I'll let them participate in the things that my own children don't want to participate in. He said, but here's the thing about them, and here's what you need to understand. In order for the sinners to participate, they got to get saved first. They got to become citizens of the city. Because they can't be citizens, they can't get to the house of the master unless they're citizens of the city. But once the sinners get saved, they too are about to participate in what God has for us this season. You are about to see an influx of sinners coming into the kingdom. We have been waiting for a revival, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I've come to tell you that you are about to live in a season that the drug addict is coming. The gangbanger is coming. The prostitute is coming. Those who don't even know God is coming. The atheist is coming. The Buddhists and the Muslims are coming. God is about to go get the sinners, the people that nobody expected to be in the kingdom. He's about to go get them. And when he brings them in, they will participate in the things that God has for this people in this season. Because they're going to be so glad that they ain't outside of the gate any longer. That they're going to be happy and grateful that God is going to use them immediately and give them things that should have been for the others is now going to be for them. Somebody give God a praise for the sinners that are about to be added to the kingdom. Now watch this, and I'm going to close right here. He says, but for all of those who made excuses and declined my invitation, he says, you will not taste of my supper. There's a whole generation of people that God is about to reject because they rejected him. They will not participate in what God is about to do. But for those of us who are too humble to be offended, just grateful to be included, you just glad that God chose you to be a part of what he's about to do. Because God, if somebody else don't want all this goodness, that you're about to pour out, let it be me. How many closes have I had? This is the fourth one? Okay. I got one more. I'm going to try to stop on number four. But let me just say this, this hopefully this last thing. And everybody hear me carefully. You or we are about to walk into a prepared season. Where everything is ready. How many more? One more. Thank you. This is my fifth and final closing. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, change your face. Get excited. Because God has invited you to participate in what he's about to do. Now, somebody give God some glory. Let him know that you are excited, that you are grateful to be included in this prepared season. Somebody give God some glory. He's not asking you for it. Just give it to him anyway. Just your presence is enough for him. But I dare you. 
not to come empty handed. I dare you to come with a praise in your mouth, with thanksgiving in your heart, and give God some glory that you are included, that now everything is ready. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody give him some glory. Somebody say everything is ready. Well, 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 Brother Brian, if everything is ready, that means I can taste a little bit of everything. Woo! I just heard the Holy Ghost say, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Come on, say, Taste and see. That the Lord is good and that his mercy endures forever. Taste his healing. Taste of his healing. Taste of his deliverance. Taste of his breakthrough. Taste of his peace. Taste of his prosperity. Taste it. Taste it. It's all there. Get a taste. Have some. And enjoy everything that God has for you. Everything. Somebody say everything. Y'all ain't caught me. Tell somebody I need a little bit of this. I need a little bit of that. I want to taste everything. If, if it's on here, I want to taste it. If it's out here, I want to experience it. Dominion, power, authority, breakthrough, deliverance, salvation, peace, everything, healing, everything. God has for me. I want to take everything that God has. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In Jesus' name. I, I told y'all I was gonna let y'all go. But I don't I don't think y'all understand that everything is ready. Everything you've been waiting on is ready. All your promises are ready. Your destiny is ready. Your purpose is ready. Your healing is ready. Your breakthrough is ready. Your child's salvation is ready. Your husband's salvation is ready. Your wife's salvation is ready. Your mama's salvation is ready. Pookie is ready. Ray Ray is ready. Tell somebody everything is ready. Now take and see. I'm, 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 I'm done, because everything is ready. And it is ready right. Hold on for a second. Who in here needs to be healed? Then your healing...
I hear you, God. I preached a couple weeks ago about the man who was waiting on the water to be moved. And he didn't know when it was going to be moved. He had a wait. But God has sent me to tell you that your waiting days are over. Because he's here. And now that he is here, he has released everything. Everything that heaven has for you has been released. All you got to do is just taste it. Everything. Okay. I, 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 yeah, okay. I, I'm going to leave that alone. Because all I can tell you is everything is ready. Now. Watch this. Any of you are crazy enough not to be offended because you weren't originally invited. You can have everything that that other generation rejected. He says, go get them, go get them. Go get those that I know who will be grateful. If you're one of the grateful, you can have everything. Because God has everything already ready. And he refuses to let any of it go to waste. He's going to find somebody. You better hear me. He's going to find somebody to sit at his table. Now the question is, will it be you? In Jesus' name, amen.